Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, April 2nd, 2023. The title of this lesson and Boyd's commentary, as well as Towson's Press and the National Sunday School commentary is The Empty Tomb. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Now, before we get into our lesson, let's start with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you giving you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we just thank you for your son dying on the cross for our sins, Lord, and connecting us back to you. So therefore, Lord, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we love you. We bless your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, and we'll be in the New King James Version of the Bible today. Then our main thought will be coming from Luke chapter 24, verse 5, which says, Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, the aim of our lesson is we will compare and contrast the various reactions to the person having hearing about Jesus' resurrection. Confess the areas of our life where we look for Jesus and didn't find him. Lastly, identify one aspect of the congregational life that most embodies the significance of the resurrection. Now, as we do each week, We'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in the fifth lesson of the third quarter in the new unit titled Experiencing the Resurrection. This week's lesson is coming out of the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Gospel of Luke is attributed to Luke, who is described as a Gentile as well as a doctor. These traits seem to influence his writing uh, in this Gospel, which was predominantly featuring healing and, and um, the, the plight of women and children. It is a very scholarly style of writing, and it's consistently um, told from a viewpoint of a non-Jewish perspective when it comes to places as well as events. Now, Luke's gospel fo focuses on the nature of salvation that Jesus Christ provides. Because Jesus encounters a wide variety of people in the book of Luke, this gospel offers a glimpse into the different facets of salvation, its spiritual, physical, and social dimensions. Now, because Jesus speaks in many parables in the Gospel of Luke, it also becomes a source of deep reflection into the nature of God's reigns and the ways of living faithful in this world. The book um, follows along with the other two synoptic Gospels uh, in a similar perspective, and that's the Gospel of Matthew as well as Mark. Now, leading up to our lesson today, Jesus had administered for about three and a half years after being baptized by John the Baptist and receiving acknowledgement from his father as his faithful son. Now, during these three and a half years, years, Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He performed many miracles and taught the disciples the good news of him being the way, the truth, and the life as well as being the promised Messiah who will reconcile mankind with the Father. Now, here we find the night before Jesus' uh, crucifixion, there was a celebration called the Last Supper with, uh, with his, it was an intimate dinner with his disciples. It was an act of humility where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And while they were all sitting there eating at the Last Supper, we find that Jesus announced that one of them would actually betray him. Jesus also introduced this new ordinance in which his followers should observe, and that is called the Last Supper or Communion. Now, while Jesus uh, went into the Garden of Gethsemane, just a little bit away from the disciple, Judas at the same time had gone and betrayed Jesus. It was there in the garden that Jesus began to pray. He specifically ad addressed God the Father about the events that will be happening soon. He also prayed about his own disciples, as well as those who were somewhat they believe in him, including you and I. Lastly, he prayed about it for himself. At that point, we find that Jesus was arrested. And then th through a series of trials, we find that um, Pilate actually gave that final order 
to allow them to crucify Jesus at the beckoning of the Jewish leaders. Now, Jesus hung on that cross for about six hours before dying. He was taken down from the cross by friendly hands. He was anointed with spices, according to Jewish tradition. Then he was buried in the tomb of a rich man. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 3, which says, now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and a certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices, which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So while we commonly combine Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection um, as being this final sac uh, sacrificial lamb, each part, however, of these states of Jesus being actually means something. By, by means of death, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy and brought man's freedom from slavery, uh, from the slavery of sin. By means of burial, Jesus removed any doubt that he was actually dead. And last but not least, and what we're talking about today, by means of resurrection, Jesus proved that he has the power over death. This assures us that if we truly trust and obey Jesus, we will one day, like him, rise from the dead also. So here we find that Jesus had laid down his life and died on the cross for our sin. Make no doubt, he laid down his life. No one took his life. Then the body of Jesus was removed from the cross and taken to the tomb of a wealthy landowner. His body was prepared with oil and spices, wrapped in linen, and he was laid to rest. However, the chief priests and Pharisees at that time, they weren't done with Jesus yet. See, they had heard about um, how he had um, amazingly predicted that he would come back to life after three days. So, just to be sure that none of his followers would try to somehow pull a fast one by stealing his body, the religious leaders arranged a, uh, a post or, or posted guards at the tomb and put a stone there to seal Jesus inside. So to them, the story of Jesus had seemingly come to an end. Jesus, we find, was buried on a Friday. Now, some believe that is on a Thursday by many accounts. However, we find that three days later, three women came to anoint his body with oil, according to Matt, Matthew, uh, Matthew, as well as Mark, the other two synoptic gospel. Here we find there was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with several other women. See, when they got there, uh, they didn't find Jesus. Now, one thing is important to know, the reason they didn't come the day after Jesus uh, died and was buried, because that next day was the Sabbath. So you could not work on a Sabbath. So Sabbath is the last day of the week. So they came on the first day of the week, according to the scripture here. Um, and there they came to see about Jesus, to do um, the, the ritual of anointing his body. Now, while they expected to anoint Jesus, the tomb was empty. That, that's a shout right there. The tomb was empty. The, the sealed stone had been removed. Now it was way too heavy for, for the women. The guards definitely wouldn't have moved it. No one from the outside moved that stone, but Jesus was gone. The next part of our lesson moved to verses four through eight, which says, and it happened that as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garment. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hand of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise again. And they remembered his words. So here we find the women came to the tomb because that, that's where they saw Jesus was buried. They saw him going from the cross and, and uh, being encased in the tomb and putting a stone in front of it. So what did they do? They go and, and uh, to, to anoint his body, to show proper respect for the dead. The, but when they got there, we, we learned that they, they discovered the empty tomb. 
Now, this change, not seeing Jesus in his tomb, seeing the stone roll away, it, it was perplexing to them. that They didn't know what happened. It, it, it would have been confusing. It, it was no clarity there. Just like if we were there, we would have had the same uh, type of response. Jesus was there. Then Jesus was not there. Where did he go? The body that was presumed dead should be remain dead. But that's not the case with Jesus. So as they stood there puzzled, two angels suddenly appeared um, clothed in dazzling, shiny robes. The women were terrified and they bowed to their faces to the ground. We find over and over in the Bible, whenever angels and messengers from God appear, the people that see them um, are, are struck by fear because it's something they've never seen before. So they are, they are in awe. These women are no different. The two angels asked these women a very important question. Why do they search for the living among the, the, uh, the dead? See, the tomb is where the dead remain, but Jesus was not there because Jesus was alive. So the angel asked this question. Listen, one thing that people are, are searching for all over this world is life. They want to have a life that is fulfilling and successful. Most want to be happy and be able to have a, you know, real enjoyment of life. The problem is, brothers and sisters, is searching for meaning, purpose, and life in this world is searching among the dead. Anything that the world claims um, to, to bring purpose and, and life is dead. These, th these things of the world is focused on the here and now. They're temporal. We can't take them with us. We find even, even as Jesus was resurrected, guess what was left behind? The temporary clothes that he had on. All of these things pass away. So all the things of this world is dead. But the one thing that gives us true purpose and, and, and life is seeking God through Jesus Christ. So instead of searching on the level which is falling, a dead world, we need to look up and search for God. It is Jesus that brings life that has a real and inter eternal meaning. It, 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 it will meet the desires of the heart more than anything else that we can find in this world could ever even offer us. These women were seeking a salvation or the savior in this case in the wrong place. He was, they were searching for him among the dead, but Jesus was not there because he was alive. We have to make sure we're not searching for purpose and searching for life among the dead of this world. Instead, we need to seek Christ. So the angel tells them that he has risen. And, they, and, and when the angel says this, the angel actually rebuked the woman at that time and says, don't you remember what Jesus told you? I mean, Isaiah prophesied about this and they were Jews. So they would know about the prophecy Isaiah in, in the Old Testament um, talked about Jesus and, and the Messiah coming and dying for us. Jesus himself had proclaimed in the New Testament, we find. Um, so the angel said, don't you remember? So what we find here is this is not something unexpected, unplanned, or unforeseen. If we read Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. We are know it says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. In the New Testament, where Jesus told them and the angels were was referring to, in Luke chapter 18, verse 32 and 33, it's Jesus says, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scorn him and kill him, but on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus told them this already. The angels point to the women to believe what Jesus said, even above what their own eyes could see. See, their eyes could not see Jesus. So the angels said they should have heard the word that he had said and understand that because he wasn't there, that means he has risen again. Therefore, he is not dead. See, this is the same thing we need to understand today. We have to believe um, what the word says above or more than what our eyes see. 
This is known, brothers and sisters, as FAITH. F-A-I-T-H. The acronym I like to use uh, that uh, Minister Sam also likes to use is forsaking all, I trust him. See, when we, when we see life around us being all doom and gloom, we can remember what the word says that our weeping may endure for the night but joy comes in the morning. When the enemy tells us that a good God would not let us suffer and be persecuted, we can remember what the word says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. It says, you will be hated for, for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When People tell us that we're nobody and we're good for nothing. We can remember what the word says in that great is he that's in me than he that's in the world. This is why it's so important that we not only read the Bible, read the word, but we need to meditate on it and we need to hide it in our heart so we can remember it when what we see does not align with what the word says and we have to determine what we believe. Therefore, if we believe the word, even though we can't see it, therefore we have faith. But if we only believe what we see, there's no need for faith. And we don't believe. So this is what the angel is telling them now. And this uh, back then, and this is what the angels is telling us right now. We need to remember what the word says in all situations, regardless of what we see. As we move down to verses 9 through 11, it reads, When they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other Mary with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seems to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Here we find that when um, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, mother of James, along with the other women, so the evidence of the resurrected Jesus, um, they remembered the words that Jesus had told them. So they were excited about going back and tell somebody about what they heard, uh, this wonderful news that one can possibly imagine. They saw that Jesus was alive and the fact that he had triumphed over death. So even though we find, though, they were excited when they were told the disciples who, in fact, heard the same thing they heard about from Jesus, that he will be crucified, buried, but he will be resurrected on the third day. They heard the same thing. Yet when the women told them, they didn't believe. There was two reasons that they may not have believed. Number one, they knew that it was impossible for something like this to happen, except God. And then last but not least, in the first century, um, the testimony of women were not deemed reliable. So they didn't believe him. The first thing we understand about Jesus here, which is important, is that from his birth all the way to his resurrection, or, or as my mom says, from the womb to the tomb, people um that the people that he used the people that received or bear witness to this the new good news immediately or initially those were the people on the bottom part of you know the ring they're the people that were on the lower end of the social economic or cultural ladder that's who jesus used from the um shepherds that witnessed Jesus' birth to G these women we're talking about today that witnessed the um Jesus resurrection that they, they they were on the, the lower end of the socioeconomic chain here, but Jesus still used them. Yet these men looked, dismissed them as, a, as what they were saying was nonsense. But this lets us know, brothers and sisters, that God can use any and everyone he wish, including a donkey like he did in the Old Testament, to get his point across. The reason we need to understand this is that we need to know that it's God who qualifies. We are all unqualified, but God qualifies us to do his will. So if we're called to do it, then we should understand that God will qualify us to do his will, just like he qualified the women to tell the uh, disciples about the resurrected Christ. We then move down to our last verse, verse 12, where Peter reacts. It reads, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloth lying by themselves. 
he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. So we knew from the beginning, Peter was slow to believe. He was slow to believe the lady's testimony um, from the mouth of the angels. He was slow to believe the tomb was empty. And here he Stephen is still slow to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, this is not so amazing, the fact that he didn't believe, because we find on, on days that it is cloudy and dark and, 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 and dull, we tend to be forgetful, even to those things that seem to be so obvious. See, Mary was disturbed about the empty tomb, and here we find Peter is also disturbed about the empty tomb. Why? Because both of them, for a time, forgot the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, when Peter goes to the tomb, he also finds it empty. The only thing left there was the cloth that Jesus' body was wrapped in, which is in coordinates with the Jewish burial rituals where they were wrapped the body into um, pieces of linen. Something remarkable took place here, but Peter didn't quite fathom what it was. Not yet, anyway. He goes away amazed and impressed at what had happened. In his amazement, though, He's still not believing that Jesus uh, raised, was raised from the dead at this point. But the women, they already do because the, 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 the angel had told them what had happened. But Peter, he still a little, uh, has a little disbelief. But later, we'll find that he will become the rock or foundation uh, of the church that Jesus has called him to be. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, Luke's testimony, as well as the testimony of each of the gospel writers, is that we find that Jesus is not dead. He has risen. This historical fact of the resurrection is the foundational stone of our Christian faith. We even find years later, the apostle Paul declares the same truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. He says, for what I have received, I pass on to you as a, a, as a first importance, that Christ died on a cross for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture. This is the foundation of our faith because it's believing that Christ died for our sins and the fact that he made us free and reconciled us with the father. That's how we are saved and that's how we gain eternal life. So brothers and sisters, as we walk through this life, we must decide what we're really seeking to find. If we're desiring real life, then we must turn away from those things that are dead in this world and turn towards Christ. Because all the things of this world offers, uh, the, the value is absolutely nothing. Instead, we have to turn our search to the knowledge of God more and more each day. It's only Jesus can offer us true life. He rose from the dead and is alive to this day and will remain alive for all eternity. The question is, will we spend eternity with him as well? And there's only one way. And he said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face turn towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.